it is an honor always to be standing behind this pulpit. Amen. We, um, you know, we just feel so grateful to be entrusted by your pastors. We love them. Um, we've been together like 30 years with them, and they are, they are a God connection in our lives. Amen. How many of you can say that about some people that God has hooked you up with, yes. and they've been with you through everything. Amen. We need one another. We need community. We need the Holy Spirit who's on the inside of each of us. Sometimes you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through your good friend. Amen. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful that they're, they're led of the Lord. Well, like I said earlier, I just got back from the Southwest Believers Convention, which was amazing, and uh, the Lord changed my message. I had something different I was going to preach on, but we're going to talk about love today, and I think it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be a little bit practical, but I think that's good, because it's the natural and the supernatural coming together that we need. Amen. So I want to talk today about how's your love life. How's your love life? And I don't get to be with you guys very often, so be praying for me, all right? That I can articulate everything that the Lord wants to deposit in your hearts today, amen? You know, lately, things have been a little crazy, and it seems like Jesus is coming soon, right? All the signs are there, but if Jesus tarries his coming, and I go home to him at a very old age. The only words I desire on my tombstone are she loved well. Amen? Amen. You know, we all like to think that we're great at loving. But it's not until we encounter those people or circumstances that challenge us to do the work within ourselves that's necessary to keep loving well. Right? When it's a stranger or a mere acquaintance who pushes our buttons, it's a bit easier to dismiss, right? But it always cuts the deepest when it's someone who's close to you, someone that you love the most, because those are the people who make this life worth living, right? Those are the people that we desire to live in harmony and peace with. And I could say for the last five years, I've been on an intense journey of learning how to love at a level that I never thought was possible. Are you guys ready to be transformed? It's completely transformed how I feel and experience every single relationship in my life, especially my relationship with myself. Do you know you have a relationship with yourself? Yes. The Holy Spirit indwells us, right? And becoming more full of God's love, his vast love for me, has allowed me to pour out more love into everyone in my life. And being transformed, that happens to you, right? Although others will surely benefit from it, the miracle of love happens in you. You are the one who gets to experience and feel that love, right? So what is love? We're going to talk about it today. It's not just an attribute of God. It is literally who he is. Amen? I love this quote from Dr. E. Wadsworth. She says, we were made from love, by love, for love and to love. Say that with me. From love, from love. by love, by love. For, love. for love, and to love. And to love. We could say it's like the container or the vessel that we are designed to live in and flow from. That's God's best for us. And you know, there's some science behind love. Love is natural as well as supernatural. And God created us with not only the ability to experience his love, that love that's the fruit of the spirit on the inside of us, right? Yes. But there is a love that can actually be proven scientifically. Wow. Right? Dr. Edie also says your body is the most powerful pharmacy on the earth. Wow. And it can affect the way you experience your life every single day with the power of your mind, which is literally our gift from God, yeah. right? It's so powerful because we're made in his image. This is why God needs us to renew our minds every day, right? So we can live transformed lives. He needs us to think his thoughts, right? That's how we're going to be operating at our highest, most loving version of ourselves. 
Let me give you an example of this, like scientifically, biologically, how this happens. Have you ever just like randomly thought of someone? Someone just like popped into your head or you saw a picture of someone, maybe it's your spouse or your parent, or have you ever just been like watching your kids play across the room and you're just watching them from afar and they may not even be interacting with you at all. They're kind of off doing their thing. But all of a sudden, you just like in your mama heart, in your parent heart, you just experience this warm glow that comes over you, right? Just because you love them so much, you had some loving thoughts about them, they're so precious to you, you're so thankful for them, and biologically, you are experiencing the emotion of love. Amen? Amen. And it's so powerful. You know, your body releases, we know it releases oxytocin, other love hormones, right? Because of the thoughts that we have. So it's our thoughts which always create what we're able to feel. It all starts with the thoughts, and our thoughts are so powerful. And scientifically, it's proven that you actually function best when you learn to live from a place of love. Your body functions best. They say medically that your heart, your lungs, your immune system is stronger when you tell your body to secrete chemicals of love. Molecules of love actually strengthen your muscles. Amen? These are incredible, nearly impossible to believe benefits that you can create for yourself when you choose to be in the world in a loving way. Right, I know this doesn't feel true, right? I know sometimes it feels like, I would be feeling more loving, but you don't know the people in my life, right? You don't know my mother-in-law, you don't know my spouse, you don't know my kids, right? Or your coworkers, right? And so there are many things that are gonna to try to knock us out, right? We humans, we get knocked out of that alignment with God's love sometimes, right? But here is my question. How fast can we recover? Right? Now, you know, we're faith people. Our focus most of the time is like, you know, we're focused on just like staying in love. But you know what? We're not superhuman. Yes. We're not there yet. Yes, yes, yes. Right? That's why we're constantly like trying to control everybody's behavior around us. Right? Does that ever work? No. 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 You tried it. Instead, what if we focused on how fast can I recover when I get out? Right? Because let's be honest, it's going to happen. And what will happen if you begin to train your mind, right, when we're renewing our mind, we're training it with God's word, right? And when we begin to train ourselves, we'll, we'll become more and more sensitive to those little times when we do step out of it, right? We'll recognize that our spirit man knows. He tells us on the inside, like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know? Sometimes you ever like just wake up and you just, you're just not feeling like yourself. You're feeling irritable, you're aggravated at everybody, right? Some people call it low-level annoyance, right? <laughs> but you start to say to yourself, like, man, I don't like this. I don't like this emotional state that I've been in the last few days, right? I don't like this mindset. I don't like that conversation I had with that person. Oh, why did we gossip about that person? Why was I so resentful? Why did I let that trigger me, right? So as we get more and more equipped with God's love, we'll be more sensitive to those times that we kind of bounce out of that, right? And the reason that it feels so yucky, right? Although sometimes we want to wallow in resentment for a little bit because it feels justified when someone's done us wrong, right? That's like the protective part of our brain, yes. the primal part that yes. wants to say, hey, you know, give it back to them or give them the cold shoulder, you know? But it feels yucky because we weren't created to stay there, right? So how fast can we recover, right? When you think back to the garden, right? Back in Genesis at the beginning of everything, and there were only, there was only at first one option for living, and it was living in God's love, right? Adam and Eve, and they had the perfect environment. They didn't even have clothes on. They didn't even know they didn't have clothes on, right? They were covered with God's love and glory. 
they were in perfect union with him and with each other, right? They were peaceful. And then what happened, right? Fear entered in. The enemy got them to believe a lie and a lie will always cause fear, right? There must have been something that God's keeping from them is what they thought, right? The enemy questioned them and tried to get them to look outside of what God has provided for them for something more. And when you think about it, if you know about Satan, that's exactly what he was dealing with, right? He was once a high angel who had everything that he could ever want. But what happened? He believed a lie. He tried to exalt himself above his maker, wow. right? So this is why the enemy comes to torment Adam and Eve, to get them off track, to get us off track, because that's the torment that he lives in daily. He's not where he's supposed to be, wow. right? And he, you know, misery loves company. Every single emotion that we have, right, positive or negative, is always going to stem from those two places, either love or fear. That's where every single emotion can be listed under those two categories in varying degrees, right? We know that God's best is to reunite us to himself and our true self, right? Our renewed man is our true self. That's who God designed us to be. Right? And it operates best in love. Our old man operated from fear. Right? Fear consists of our ego and a scarcity mindset and lack and selfishness. Right? That's the old man. So when we look at everything this way, under these two headings, it helps us to have so much compassion for ourselves and for others. Right? Compassion for our humanness right and the fact that we've momentarily stepped away from operating as our true self right we all do it we're getting better at it but we still do it sometimes and it helps us to recognize that in others right if we just look at others and put them in those two categories they're either not saved so they're in darkness they are living in fear every day right so you can have compassion for that or they're like us, they are saved, they have the Holy Spirit, but something happened and they momentarily slid out of that true self, right? They slid into that, that fear zone. And we can have compassion for that too, because we know that, right? That happens to us as well. Yes, Lord. And in, in either case, those people need what? They need our love and our prayer support, right? So let's talk about a few truths about love. Perfect love casts out fear. Amen? Amen. 1 John 4 and 18 in the Amplified says, There is no fear in love. Dread does not exist. But full grown, so that shows us that we can grow in this area, right? Full grown love is complete. Perfect love, it turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. So how do we stay out of fear? We shift from fear back into God's love. We must do it over and over and over again every single day, right, by renewing our minds. And let God's love encapsulate us. It's where we're designed to live. We're our healthiest, healthiest version of ourselves when we're that way, right? And we're not perfect, right? But I love this saying, it says, we are perfectly loved by a perfect God, right? God doesn't expect perfection from us. Jesus did it all perfectly so we don't have to, amen? We can get better, we can strive toward that, right? But he doesn't expect perfection of us. We don't expect perfection of our children, right? We shouldn't. So whenever we find ourselves where we are overly concerned or worried about the things that other people in our lives are doing, right? That moves us out of love and into fear, right? You might say, I'm concerned about them. It's fear. Yep. That is a degree of fear. You're stepped away from the truth of what God's word says about that person in order to take on that concern or worry. 
right? Sometimes we, I think we get upset when people in our lives are going through things because that means we have some work to do, yes. right? We have to do some work on ourselves to stay in faith, to stay in that place of love and compassion and patience and all the fruit of the Spirit for them, right? It means we have to work on ourselves. You know, sometimes I think we don't want our kids to make any mistakes because we think that proves what great parents we are. But that is selfish, right? That's our ego. That's expecting perfection of them. That is not loving people well. Amen? Amen. Another thing about love is love is unoffendable. Say unoffendable. Unoffendable. It's not offended toward God. When you're in the love of God, you will not be offended at him saying, God, where are you in this? Where were you when this happened? Right? And we won't be in offense toward others or the circumstances that we're going through. I want to look at Mark chapter 7 if you've got your Bible. In verse 26 or 25, I think, this is the story of the um, Syrophoenician woman. You guys doing okay? I know this is a little different, but it's good. We need to hear it. We need some practical training sometimes. All right, so Mark 7. And I'm going to start in verse 25. It says, After hearing of him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syro of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he was saying to her, Let the children be satisfied first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. And he said to her, Because of this answer, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And going back home, she found her child lying on the bed, the demon having departed. There's another, um, I'm not sure which gospel it is, but Jesus talks about this woman having great faith. That was great faith. This woman refused to get offended, right? Jesus called her a dog. Why do you think it says here that she's a Gentile, a Syrophoenician? That means she's not in covenant with God, right? She was not a Jew. She was not a Jew, but she knew where power was and she knew how to access it. And eventually she changed her words and she called him Lord. She wanted him to be her Lord. She needed him, right? She needed what he had. She switched to calling him Lord. That's a word that you use when you have a covenant with him, amen? He's your Lord. And she knew even a tiny morsel of God's power was enough to restore her child and she refused to let go. She did not get offended when Jesus called her dog. He said great was her faith. She was able to stay in that love zone. Amen? Amen. Another aspect of love that I've learned is that love will keep you. Love will keep you. It'll keep you in church, right, where your answers are flowing by the gifts of the Spirit in your pastors. It'll keep you safe from offense when maybe that leader walks by and doesn't greet you because they have a lot of things going through their mind and they honestly didn't see you. You won't get offended when you don't get the attention that you think you need, right? It'll keep you in your marriage, right? It'll keep you at your workplace. It'll keep you serving on that team with those people that are so different from you. It'll keep you from shying away from those who vote differently from you. Amen? Another attribute of love is it doesn't have expectations of others. <coughs> what? Shouldn't we have some expectations of people? Something I've learned lately that has helped me so much is that there is your business, God's business, and their business. Say, my business, my business, God's business, God's business and, their business. and their business. 
pretty much most things in life can be filed under those headings, right? We can ask ourselves, is this my business? And that really narrows down your responsibility, doesn't it? Yes. Do you guys know what a manual is? Like for an appliance? We've got a whole box of them in a closet in our front hall. We just save them all for years. Or maybe you have one in the glove box of your car. What is that thing? It's an operating manual and it tells you all the expectations that you can have for that vehicle. These are all the ways that it's going to operate and when something's off you can go and look and see what's going on with it, right? You know, people are not robots. And we are not machines like a car. And yet we all have these unspoken secret manuals yes. for the people in our lives. Yep, that's good. Right? That's good. And it's only when they don't follow your manual that you begin to have trouble, yes. right? Oh my gosh. But people have free will. They get to choose what they want to do, right? And that's their business, right? Yes. And God's business yes. to help them through it. We cannot withhold our love just because our husband doesn't tell us that we're beautiful or they didn't offer to help with dinner, or help with the kids, or whatever we make thinks us, that we think makes us feel loved, right? Your love language, they didn't do your love language so you don't feel loved, <laughs> right? But we, when we expect other people to meet our needs, emotionally or otherwise, we're always gonna be disappointed. Yes. Because people are human and they are always gonna come up short. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Only God can meet our needs, amen? amen? That doesn't mean that we never have boundaries. Boundaries is one of those like catchphrases now that you hear on the internet, yes. right? But boundaries are for you. Mm -hmm. They're not for the other person. Boundaries should always come from a place of love yes. and not a punishment towards someone, mm -hmm. right? Your friend wants to go do something, you're like, you know, that's not something that I want to participate in. You're not stopping them from doing it. You're saying, I have a boundary in place for myself. Yes. I don't go to those places. I don't drink that. I don't do this or that. You know, boundaries are for you. Another thing I've learned about love is that nobody can feel your love. Nobody can feel your love. And technically, you can't feel theirs either. All right, let me explain. When someone hugs you, right, you may physically feel their arms around you, the pressure of their embrace, right? But their love doesn't magically like ooze into you, right? Because think about it, have you ever been maybe upset with someone or you're not really sure about someone's intentions yeah. and they come and hug you and you kind of, you don't receive it, right? What is that? You're not feeling their love they may be genuine. You're not feeling it because lo our love, our emotions come from our thoughts. You would have to have a thought about what that person's doing in order for you to feel love, right? So we must continually fill up on God's love for us because that's a role that other people were never anointed to walk in, right? You know, I hear some people say, because, you know, where I'm, I'm doing like premarital stuff now, and I coach lots of wives and mamas, and you hear people say like, well, I just fell out of love with my spouse. I just, I just don't feel love for them anymore. But that's not really possible. It's because they stopped thinking loving thoughts about their spouse, right? Like in the beginning of our dating relationship, right? We are creating so much love, that emotion of love that we feel inside because of our thoughts about that person, yes. right? We want to talk to them. We want to look at pictures of them. We want to hear their voice. You know, we want to be with them. And our brain is secreting all the good love hormones, right? And now, Chad and I were married 29 years in a, in a few days, right? In the 13th. 29 years. And... 
you have to create that love for yourself. You can't depend on your spouse doing something. You create it with your own thoughts, right? So if you want to feel more love in any of your relationships, you have to start training your brain to think more loving thoughts about them. It doesn't matter who it is, right? Make a list of 25 things that you love about your spouse, your child, your mother-in-law, whoever it is that you're not feeling as connected to that you want to feel more connected with, right? If you do that, right, even if you only get five, Okay, write down five in your journal. Tomorrow, try to write five more. Work, work up to 25, right? There's something that happens in your brain when you're writing. It connects. There's synapses yes. that are happening yeah. when you write something or journal about it. Mm -hmm. So don't just like do it mentally. Actually write it down, yeah. right? And I guarantee you that act of doing that will create thoughts of love, right? Even if it's just like, I love my mother-in-law's pot roast. Right? I love that my mother-in-law gave me my spouse. That's something to be thankful for, amen? Yeah. Start there. Amen. Yeah. Right? If you're having a hard time with someone, if you're challenged in a relationship, start there. What do you love about them? Right? Because you are the one who gets to feel that love in your body. Right? It's where we were designed to live from. And you know, people are gonna say wrong stuff. People are gonna say hurtful stuff. And sometimes that means more about them than about you, right? Remember we talked about they've, you know, slipped away temporarily from their true self into the false self. You know, something's going on inside of them. But don't entertain it in your thought life, forgive, amen? And don't rely on other people to give you joy that you can only be happy and joyful if this particular person is treating you right. Don't delegate that out. Press into God. He's your joy. Joy is the fruit of the Spirit, right? Yes. Humanity is flawed. If you think that you can look to people to fill you up, you don't know people. Yeah. You haven't been around much then, right? Because people are going to people, yeah. right? So don't look to humanity to pump you up. Look yes. to God. Yes. Because there's always going to be an element. There's going to be a thought that originates from fear that pulls us back into that false self or our old man. Yeah. And sometimes it's a sneaky thought mm. down underneath the surface, but I guarantee you it's there. You're going to have to get curious and dig it out a little bit. Mm. Let's look at John 13 and 34. Is this okay today, guys? Yeah. yeah. You're learning something? Learning. Praise God. John 13, 34, Jesus said that he gave us a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. By what? Love. By this. Yes. By this kind of love. What kind of love is that? It's the same love that Jesus demonstrated, right? It's selfless, it's forgiving, it's compassionate, it's a giving kind of love. Amen? Yeah. Not a worldly love. It's a certain kind of love that Jesus walked in. Yes. And he wants us to walk in that too, to be empowered by it. Amen? Yes. Amen. Luke 6, 26, Jesus also said, love your neighbors. Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Oh, those are some tough ones. Those are four things that are a challenge to do, right? Is this really possible? Right? If Jesus said it, I think it's possible. If Jesus said it, I think that he's anointed us to do it. We have the ability, right? Jesus pleaded with the Father to forgive those who were crucifying him. Right? Loving those who are killing you. Wow. Oh, that's a level of love we got to attain to. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Mark 12, verse 28 through 31. It says, And one of the scribes came, and hearing them arguing, and recognizing that he answered well, they asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second one is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Right? So if we only keep these two commandments, we will keep all ten. Right? Yeah. It's all summed up in these two. Because if we truly love others, we're not going to steal, we're not going to kill, yes. we're not going to lie that's about good. people. Yes. Right? Good. We can keep all the commandments that's just good. by doing these two. Love wow. the Lord and love others. But love others as yourself. Right? So we're going to have to be loving ourselves well, too. And I ask you this. Who is your neighbor? And how do we love them? And are we loving ourselves? I love this quote from C.S. Lewis. This is so good, you guys. It says, Do not waste time bothering whether you quote-unquote, love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we learn one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you presently come to love him. Can we say it again? Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. Right? When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Like, have you ever had somebody in your life who just rubbed you the wrong way? Right? That one relative who corners you at the family party to talk politics? It's like, Lord, help me. Right? Somebody who just seems so difficult to love. No matter what you do, maybe it's a coworker. They just seem to have it out for you. Right? They just have something against you and you haven't even done anything wrong. And one of the most profound things that I've learned recently is that, is the truth that it will always and forever be our thoughts that create our feelings. And it's our feelings that then drive our actions and our actions give us the results of what we are experiencing in our lives, in our relationships, right? Even when we think, nope, I feel this way because of what they did. Right? Someone did you wrong, something happened, they said something nasty to you, and this is why I'm justified to feel whatever way. Right? But no, it's still the result of what we are thinking about what they did. Right? What we're choosing to think. And this process, it's not just linear, it's cyclical too. Right? So C.S. Lewis is challenging us to realize, even if we don't have loving thoughts towards someone, and we don't feel loving emotions toward them, we can get back into the love zone by action, right? Acting as if we love someone, and it'll all come around full circle. Because your brain is saying, wow, they're doing this thing in love. I'm going to line up some thoughts with that, and the feelings will come after, right? Like praying for someone that, you know, like Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Someone that you just, they don't like you, you don't really care for them. But when you start praying for them, what happens? Something happens in them because you are allowing God's power to work in them. You're praying on their behalf, but something happens inside of you. You start to have this love for them, right? It's possible, guys. When we choose to love, it will cause compassion and love to well up on the inside of us for them. You guys know the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. I just want to look at verse 5. It says, Love is not rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. Ooh, we got to work on that one. Yes. Never mind PMS, pre, pre menopause, post menopause, all that junk, right? We can have control of ourselves. It says, it keeps no record of being wronged. Right? Let me look at it real quick. It 
Verse 5, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, it does not take into account a wrong suffered. Wow, think about that. That is challenging, right? If we don't keep record of it, and if we forgive like Jesus does, then that means that we could technically say we've never been wronged. Think about that for a second. Right? If the word says in Isaiah that the blood blots out our sins, right? When we ask for forgiveness, right? We have the ability to allow the love of God in us to blot out what others have done to us. So that technically we could say, I've never been wronged because I'm choosing to stay in love. Amen. I'm not going to take record of that. Amen. We have the ability to act in love by faith. Right? We know the Bible says that faith works by love. I think a lot of people think of that scripture and they think, well, if I don't walk in love, my prayers won't be answered. My faith won't work. Right? But it's not just that. It's also continuously receiving God's love for us, right? Because if you are not so filled up with God's love that you have confidence, you won't go to the throne of grace to obtain what you need, right? You need to go to the throne in a place of love, knowing that the Lord has open arms for you, that Jesus is there in his right hand praying for you, right? So it's both, and it doesn't matter if we feel it yet or not. Right, our false man, the old unrenewed mind, our ego doesn't want to love them. Right? It was programmed to protect itself. Very often, you know, that false man and people in the world, they see love and forgiveness as a weakness. Right? But don't buy into that lie, because love is always the way to victory. Yes, thank you, Lord. Amen? Amen. It doesn't mean that we can change anyone, right? That's between them and God. But it does mean that you will no longer be bound by those yucky feelings of hate or animosity, right? The other person may be carefree. Like, you know, you have certain thoughts about someone. They're just going about their day. They don't have a clue that you're upset with them. Who gets to feel the junk of being upset? You do, right? You want to tell them something so that they can have a thought and they can feel, feel yucky, right? But they're just going on with their life. Something that happened three weeks ago, you're still stewing on it. You are the one that has to feel that on the inside, not them. Right? That's why we got to forgive. Yes. So we can get out of that feeling and get back into love. When we make a choice to pray for someone in earnest, something happens in their hearts, but inside of us as well. That shifts our hearts to truly love them. Right? To recognize how much they must be hurting to be operating in life from their false self. Because we all know we've been there and it's no fun, right? That they are knowingly or not operating from fear and not love, because there's only ever those two options. Like I said before, they either know Christ and they're able to operate from love and their true self, or they're in darkness, not knowing Christ, right? Or they've temporarily slid back into their false self. Right? Both of those conditions should cause some compassion to bubble up on the inside of us. Right? So who is your neighbor? Remember that your closest neighbor may be the one who shares your bed. He is your neighbor. She is your neighbor. Or someone who lives under your roof. They are your closest neighbors. We're called to love them as well, right? One of the greatest things that we can do for ourselves and them is to get curious. Say, get curious. Get curious. Resist the temptation to protect your ego, right? And to shift into love. Getting curious about what they must be feeling in order to be acting that way. Because hurt people hurt people, right? Yes. When someone lashes out at us, rather than shutting down, which is like stonewalling and giving them a silent treatment, or throwing it back at them, stop for a minute and ask yourself, I wonder what's going on with them. Yes. That question helps me so much to not get in, in strife and judgment of others. I wonder what's going on with them, right? 
And even when we are unexpectedly short-tempered, right? Maybe we snap at our kids or we're a little bit short with our spouse or whatever, right? Love ourselves enough to ask ourselves the question, hey, what's going on? What's going on with you today, right? Check in with yourself. Because when we don't condemn ourselves, we will get good at not condemning others, right? Compassion will always arise from this type of a posture. There's so many places in the Bible, so many. I, started, I was going to write some down, but it was like, there's so many. I'm like, it's just too much. There's so many places where it says that Jesus was moved with compassion, and then we saw great miracles, right? Amen. That compassion opened up the door for miracles. I want to be more like Jesus, amen? amen. I want to be a conduit of his power to flow through so mercy and love can flow into other people's situations, right? And God's love for us is never based on our behavior, right? Have you done something wrong? And go to the Lord, he still loves you. His love for us is not dependent upon that. And we need to get a revelation of that, that our love for other people is not dependent on their behavior either. Right? As his followers, we are never at liberty to withhold love from people, no matter what they're doing. Because we can only love or we can judge, but we cannot do both at the same time. Right? If we hold on to judgment towards someone, we're going to have to let go of love. There's no space for both of them. But love feels so much better, right? Heard this quote from Dr. Jolyn Whitaker the other day. The voice of condemnation of others is never the voice of God in your mind. When we have a thought of someone, a condemning thought toward them, a judgmental thought, that is never God. That is not the Lord. You know, we may judge someone's behavior to determine whether or not we want to allow them close proximity to our lives, but we're never allowed to judge others. We could judge their behavior, but we don't have a license to judge them, right? The Bible says judge not, and you won't be judged. Plus the word, it says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, right? I don't want to be on that team. Amen? So when we get upset by something that someone said about us, instead of getting angry, we need to stop, we need to pause and evaluate, right? Sometimes we need to honestly ask ourselves, love ourselves and our growth enough to ask ourselves, could they be right, right? Is there some truth to what they said? Ask yourself that first. If yes, they've just given you an area where you can grow. Right? And improve. And that's a gift. Amen? Amen? That's a gift in this earth school that we're living on. Right? Where everyone and everything is our curriculum. Right? The people in our lives are the curriculum for our lives. This is how we perfect those things. This is how we mature. This is how we grow in love and every other fruit of the Spirit. If we were here by ourselves, we wouldn't need to. It's all these people that we're stuck here with, right? They're the curriculum for us. And when you look at it that way, when you're up against something hard or something happens, or someone says something nasty to you, stop and say like, wow, what can I learn from this? How can I grow here? You know, and maybe you can grow in the fruit of the spirit. Maybe you can pray for them, right? And the other thing is, is if the person, whatever they said is not right, right? It wasn't truth about you and you're still upset about it. Ask yourself this, can I allow others to be wrong about me? Right? Right? Can I allow someone to be wrong about me? Can I handle that emotion of rejection or, you know, hurt? Can I allow that for a minute? Sit with it for a minute? Okay. People were wrong about Jesus all the time. Yeah, they were. Right? He didn't try to change them. He didn't try to convince them. That's not who my father says I am. <laughs> right? He didn't say that. 
He allowed it, right? Because that's love. And I looked up the definition of lovable, and it is having characteristics that attract love and affection from others. But did you know that there's a difference between your lovability, people finding you lovable, and your love ability? Right? And understanding that your current levels of love are going to ebb and flow. Right? And also those who that you are in relationship with, their level of love is going to ebb and flow. Right? And that's going to determine the peace that you're going to experience in that relationship. Amen. 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 So if we are to honestly evaluate our ability to love, right? Say we wake up one day and we're like, you know what? I'm just not feeling it. I'm feeling like a level 5 out of 10. Right? Be honest with yourself. Right? We're faith people. We like to say we're at a 10 all the time. Be honest. God is the God of truth, right? You want to work toward that and improve, but be honest with yourself. That means that if you're only at a level 5, you can only give love to others at a level 5, but also you can only receive love at a level 5. Yeah. Okay? So if we don't take time to meditate on God's love for us, it gets a little bit depleted, right? We've got to do it every single day. We've got to draw from that supply when it gets low. We've got to stir up that gift inside of us. Amen? Amen. So you think about it this way. If the person that you're in relationship with, whether it's your spouse, your child, an in-law, if they are currently giving you love from a level 8, but you're at a level 3, you're only able to receive at a level 3. Right? So your spouse may be doing something that in their mind is so full of love toward you. Right? In their mind. But you're not able to receive it. Oh, so true. And the two of you are going to be disconnected. Right. Okay? And we got to communicate about these things. Right? you got to open up your mouth. Because it's those sneaky thoughts that the enemy loves to energize and get us into strife over, right? Your spouse walked by, they didn't smile at you or whatever, you know? And all of a sudden you've got all these thoughts, oh, they must be mad at me, you know, I must have done something wrong. And you just, you stew in that. Open your mouth, ask, right? Say, what did you mean by this when you said this? Because that kind of felt hurtful to me. And they probably would say, oh, I didn't mean it that way at all. Right? Don't allow the enemy any foothold in there. Yes. Right? Amen. Keep the communication open because that will help us not to make assumptions about the actions of those around us. Right? And we need to stop blaming other people for our emotions. Yes, that's good. Our emotions come from our thoughts. We are in control of that. Right? Recognizing that we are the only ones responsible for our current love level, that will set you free, right? You can go, you know, get in your car and put on some worship music and get filled up, right? Because honestly, we don't want to be farming that task out to others because they can never truly satisfy that need in us. Right. If you're waiting for your spouse to do something that makes you in a good mood, it's not going to work. Right? And when we're struggling emotionally, when we're not feeling right, be assured we have stepped away from the knowledge of God's love for us. When we expand our ability to love ourselves by feeding on the truth of who we are in Christ, then we can expand our ability to love others. But it starts with us. Right? you got to have a full tank. It's like they say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first, then help the person next to you. Right? When we struggle to love ourselves, that will often show up as dysfunctional behavior. Like people pleasing, right? We're trying to get in someone's good graces. We're trying to get them to act loving toward us. So we people please. We do something that we don't really want to do, but we're doing it to make the other person happy. But it backfires on us every time because then we get resentful. Right? And we're like, oh, I didn't really want to go to that restaurant, but I'm going there because he wanted to go, and I'm trying to be, you know, light and easy and flexible, right? But then you're sitting there, and you're aggravated looking at the menu, and you're like, hey, I didn't really want to come here. That was your choice. You should have spoke up, right? Don't people please. 
Don't manipulate. Stop control freaking everyone in your life, right? And when we're not loving ourselves, well, we will work really, really hard to earn love from other people, thinking that somehow we can increase our lovability. And when we take time to fill up our own tank, we won't need others to add to it to make us feel good, right? It's wonderful to get validation and to get compliments and to have people that you love say loving things to you and show love to you, right? But we need to fill ourselves up so much that when they do that, that's just overflow. That's just like the icing on the cake. Like I was already there. Jesus filled me up today. I'm already feeling so loved, right? And we need to remember that we all have the same value and the same level of love that our Father demonstrated to us with the price that Jesus paid. Amen? Amen. So don't believe the lie that it's arrogant to love yourself. It's not. Arrogance means it's thinking of yourself that you're better than others. That's arrogance. That's actually a sign of insecurity. Yes. yes. Right? But true love is a sign of security in God's vast love his unending love for you and others. That's where security comes from. Amen? And I pray, you guys, that as you ponder these thoughts this week, it gives you a shift in your heart and releases you and your people to give and receive so much love. Amen? I just want to look at Isaiah 61 and verse 1. This is where Jesus found his calling. This is the book that he opened up when he went into the temple and preached for the very first time. And this is what he said. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Amen? Amen. The day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, and the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a spirit of fainting. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. He may be glorified. Worship team, if you guys could come up for a minute. Praise God. I just had this on my heart this morning that I want you guys to know if you have been brokenhearted by something or someone, God has made perfect provision for that. Amen? Amen. When we choose to stay in that grief, we're thinking about ourselves, right? There's a time for grief, right? It's a process, but there's also a time to get set free. Right? Jesus knows our sorrows. And he already took that grief. Amen? And I just want you to know that the anointing is here to bind up that wound. If your heart has been wounded by something or someone, right? 1 John 3, 8 says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. Fear is of the devil. That's his mode, right? The Amplify says that it will undo, destroy, loosen, and dissolve those works right? Jesus doesn't want us just to get through something, right? The anointing can make it like it never happened, like it left no trace of that hurt remaining in your heart today, amen? Amen. Let's stand up, and I feel like I want to lay hands on whoever feels that they have a hurt, a wound in their heart, and it's time to put a line in the sand today and let it go. It's time to let the anointing break that yoke off of you. Amen? So just feel free to come up if you want prayer.
again for years, let it go. Let it go. Let it go today. It's time to tell a new story. It's time to tell, tell the story of God's redemption. God can restore that relationship. God can restore your broken heart. He wants to restore you. He wants to refresh you. He doesn't want you just to get through something that was hard. He wants to make it that that leaves no trace of evidence in your life. God's power is yeah. here. The anointing is here. Just soak it in. Just soak it in. Say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have given me your joy. Thank you, Lord, you have made provision for all of it. It's not a surprise to you. You knew what would happen, Lord. It's not a surprise to you, but also you made provision for it, even before the foundation of the world. Jesus took it all. He took those hurts, those wounds. He was wounded himself, not just physically. He was wounded in his heart. He was betrayed by those closest to him. He was spoken against. He had words said about him that were untrue. He was slandered. And he chose to forgive. And he did it for us so that we can enter into that now. We can enter into that same flow of love. Amen? That's where we were designed to live from. When it doesn't feel good, it's because we're stepped away from living in that love flow. We come back in alignment with it today, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. I just want to say if you're here today or maybe you're watching online and you don't yet know this incredible love that God has for you, I want you to know that he wants you to know that he loves you and he wants you to live every day in the power of his love. Amen? So if you're watching online or if you're here in this room, let's just all bow our heads and close our eyes for a second. And I just want us to repeat this and agree in your heart. Father God, I have lived for myself, and now I want to live for you. My way, it hasn't worked. I want you in my life. I need you in my life. I need your plan for my life. I need your love. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you that he died on the cross in my place. And that he took the punishment for my sins so that I could receive his righteousness so now I can live free. Jesus, I believe you died and you rose again and you are alive forevermore. Take my heart, take my life, and make something beautiful with it. You are now my Lord and my Savior serve you all.